So in this segment, we're going to be talking about why the UK simply can't or won't rejoin the EU single market. It's not so easy as to just, you know, say, oh, we want to join the single market and you're like, yeah, cool, bro, you're in. Um, so I'm going to try and dispel some of the myths in this video. Um, it's going to be a long essay type video, um, uh, more scripted or scripted different to my usual content. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully um, it's a lot of work, but hopefully this helps um, everyone understand kind of some of the things around the misinformation around the single market. So what is the EU single market? So the EU single market is about mainly regulatory standards. The single market is the unified market encompassing all EEA members. Anything you see in quotation marks is something I've taken from a, a website. So um, I'll link all my sources below because I know some people don't do that, uh, which I think is very scummy. It is underpinned by a single set of rules and the principle of mutual recognition of goods and services. So essentially everyone in the single market acknowledges that another member's um, goods are up to the same or similar standards. So there's no reason to have uh, border checks uh, for regulatory uh, goods. Obviously a customs union is a different thing. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, that all members of the single market accept each other's uh, goods and services as equivalent to their own. Therefore no need for border checks. Customs fees are a separate thing need their own video because some uh, countries like Norway are in the EU single market but not in the customs union which means that there are customs fees and potentially tariffs on uh, goods going from the EU to Norway for example. The EU single market allows the free movement of people and these are fu these are the four ten fundamental tenets of the EU single market. All of them must be accepted. So for, you know, Britain doesn't accept freedom of movement. We rejected it. That's what uh, Theresa May effectively um, built her kind of Brexit around. And also so did um, a lot of the Brexiteers back in uh, 2016. They said we wouldn't get rid of freedom of movement for us. But we would do for, uh, you know, EU countries. So the four freedoms are free movement of goods, free movement of capital, freedom to establish and provide services, so free movement of services, um, and free movement of persons or people. These three, uh, the, the three different ways of membership for the EU single market works like this. So you've got full membership, so a full EU membership. For us, that's not going to happen. Uh, that one's non-debatable because it's just too much effort to explain that system. Um, and it's going to make the video way longer, um, especially when, uh, you know, it's a long process to apply to become an EU member state and every member gets a veto of it. So you've got an EFTA type agreement. So this is when people talk about a Norway style agreement. Um, this we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so you can, if you, if we somehow manage to join after, we'd also have to sign up to the European Economic Area. However, Norway will say no way, get it uh, to us joining after. So it's kind of a mute point, but I think it's worth exploring it anyways. And you've got the Swiss Star Agreement, which the EU don't like and have said they won't replicate. So no one else is going to get, you know, the um, hundred or two hundred plus bilateral deals that Switzerland has with the EU because it's a lot of effort. And I'll talk about that in the relevant sections of the video. So if we talk quickly about the history of the EFTA agreement with the EU. So the European Economic Area was established by an agreement on the European Economic Area, an international agreement which enables the extension of the EU single market to member states of EFTA. So essentially the EU came up with an agreement with EFTA, which is a separate trading block, let's not forget here. These are two, two different trading blocks. Um, and essentially allowed EFTA members into the EU single market. The EEA, the European Economic Area, links the EU member states with three EFTA countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway. Now you realise I didn't mention Switzerland because Switzerland aren't members of the EEA, they, weren't, they didn't sign up to it. This links them into an internal market, these three countries, uh, governed by the same basic rules. These rules aim to enable free movement of persons, goods, services and capital within the EU single market, including the freedom to choose residence in any country within this area. Um, obviously, if you're a resident of the country, you need to follow the residency rules around the country you're trying to uh, move to. So if we talk about the uh, the why the Norwegian model wouldn't work for us, so Norway would just veto us joining after they've said so. Um, you know, essentially Norway can give political reasons or economic reasons as to why the UK um, should not be allowed to do after. In fact, they didn't have to give any reasons. They just say we just don't want you in the club. Get out before we get the long boats out. So, however, even if Norway said yes and we join after, we'd still have to join the European Economic Area. That's another big problem because the EEA Council, 
takes political decisions leading to the amendment of the EEA agreement. So it, it goes to the EEA Council, that will go through all the EU member states, so including the possible enlargement of the EEA. So, f you know, it'd have to be uh, done by an agreement to enlarge the amount of EEA members. Decisions by the EEA Council are taken by consensus between all EU member states on the one hand and the three EFTA states, including Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway. So for, in order for us to join EFTA, we'd have to get the permission of these three states anyways, including Switzerland. All it would take is one EU member state to say no to us joining um, the EEA, that's it. We'd also have to accept all the EU rules without any say in them, would effectively be rule takers not rule makers, which we already know how Brexiteers feel about that. Also if we joined uh, this, this uh, joined in this method, there would also be payments into the EU's budget, Norway pays um, in based on the agencies they use and also their GDP is factored into it. So um, I think they use around 38 out of the 40 or so um, agencies. Um, Norway paid more per capita than the UK did to the EU. The House of Commons Library has estimated that assuming that Norway didn't get a lot of money back, imitating its relationship with the EU would make the UK's contribution to the EU per, ca per head about 25% smaller. So effectively, the UK pays less per capita to, uh, to the EU than what we got back compared to Norway. Norway doesn't have any say over the rules that are, they have to implement that are given to them by the EU. The UK did. So we paid less per capita. So if we did try and go down this route, the UK would probably have to pay more um, or the same amount as Norway does per capita because we'd be using a lot of the EU's regulatory bodies. We'd also, we also have a higher, uh, a much bigger economy than Norway and of course why would Norway, Norway let us join this model um, if we're paying less than them per capita? Norway would be like, nah bro, you, you sit outside. You, know, you left the club, you had a better deal than us in some ways, you stay outside. So that's a key problem in itself. So why would Norway accept us paying less than them per capita for the same access that Norway gets? This would be a huge stumbling block and a diplomatic nightmare for the UK as we would have to pay more to be a part of EFTA with way less power than what we had. So ultimately it just won't work because politically you'd have to somehow explain to people why is it that we're paying more into the EU's budget, right, for less power, or for no power really. Um, that just, it just doesn't make sense to do that, in my opinion anyways. Uh, why the Swiss model wouldn't work. So the Swiss model is one people have touted. Uh, we can get a bespoke deal like Switzerland have. We're a bigger economy, blah, 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 blah. Okay, this one's going to get debunked as well. Um, there's a lot to talk about here. So Switzerland are a part of EFTA, but not the EEA. And this is important for a few reasons. EFTA has its own systems to make sure single market rules are being followed, right? EFTA has its own courts, its own systems to make sure everything works okay. The EFTA Surve Surveillance Authority deal with compliance of the rules to make sure EFTA countries are following single market rules. Now, the UK is and will not be a member of EFTA that fundamentally causes an issue because EFTA has its own courts and also it looks like the European Court of Justice will not get involved in certain disputes. In fact, the EFTA Court performs a similar role to the European Court of Justice in that it resolves disputes under the EEA agreement. So unless the UK allows the ECJ to deal with disputes, who would they get? Who would deal with them? Independent arbitrators who would choose them? How long would it take? It's a massive headache in itself. We've already seen the UK reject the uh, European Court of Justice in Northern Ireland protocol disputes. So, you know, for the, Euro for the UK to accept the ECJ is unlikely. Now, the EU itself are not fans of this model, the Swiss model, because everything with Switzerland goes to a referendum, and that's a Switzerland thing, right? That's a Swiss thing, and it causes its own headaches. But if you think about it, right, um, we, we have massive flips in governments um, every five to ten years, right? 10 to 15 years you could argue so another, another government could come in and try and rip up the agreements a previous one made with the eu if opinions change things can change very quickly and these different um these different bilateral agreements are built on top of each other so effectively you get rid of one say freedom of movement um it can scrap the rest of them guillotine clauses so these these go via referendum um so uh, they're built onto each other. So saying uh, an agreement on freedom of movement can lead to other agreements being worse in terms of access. So if you say no to freedom of movement, I know it says on, that's a typo. Um, if you say no to freedom of movement, what that means is you can get the rest of it will go. Now, this would not work for the UK for a lot of reasons, mainly because there are over 200 bilateral agreements between the EU and Switzerland. That's a huge task. 
The EU tried to get it changed into one giant agreement, but the Swiss people said no. The reason the Swiss model exists is because, first of all, Switzerland rejected the EEA agreement in a national referendum in 1992. So that would have been um, Switzerland joining the EEA like Norway did. Switzerland wanted to safeguard the economic integration with the EU that the EEA treaty would, would have permitted while purging the relationship of the points of contention. So essentially they wanted a more kind of bespoke deal, a, a little bit different to what the other people had, and they wanted more say over what was given. Swiss politicians stressed the bilateral nature of these negotiations, where negotiations were conducted between two equal partners, not between 16, 26, 28 or 29, as is the case for EU treaty negotiations. So essentially the Swiss government span it as, um, look, we're dealing with the EU as one entity, not you know different member states and their interests. These negotiations resulted in a total of 10 treaties negotiated in two phases with the sum of which makes a large share of EU law applicable to Switzerland but they do have some slight opt outs and I think they did this initially because they wanted Switzerland, they wanted I think all the EFTA countries to have some sort of agreement with the EU and this was a different time, you know, the 90s, wild times, right? These negotiations resulted in a total of 10 treaties negotiated in two phases with the sum of which makes a lot of the EU law applicable to Switzerland. It's a lot of work. You know, all of these agreements are a lot of work. The bilateral agreements, um, the bilateral one agreements are expressed to be mutually dependent. If any one of them is denounced or not renewed, they all cease to apply. So doing such an agreement with the UK wouldn't work because if one government, for example, says, oh, we're going to get rid of freedom of movement, right? That gets rid of everything else. On um, the 26th of May 2021, Switzerland decided again to suspend negotiations with the EU and not sign the drafted EU-Swiss Institutional Framework Agreement. The main disagreements were about freedom of movement, the level playing field and state aid rules. The UK have come up with issues about all three of these. In fact, we're being taken to the WTO over um, state aid rules. So again, this sort of agreement wouldn't work for us because we just caused too many problems. The Swiss model is one where constant disputes can arise. Now imagine Switzerland bigger and even more annoying. Yeah, that's the UK. The UK can set up, sign up to dynamic alignment with the EU on agri-foods. That would help a lot with border checks. However, it will not end them. And these mechanisms for alignment are built into the trade and cooperation agreement. There will still be customs checks. We do not have the people to deal with all of that stuff You know, as is. That's why we're having constant problems at the border. Um, so the Swiss model just wouldn't work for us for um, those reasons. One, we're not a member of EFTA. That's that's one of the major stumbling blocks. EFTA has its own mechanisms for enforcing single market compliance. Um, and without us being a part of EFTA, how you know who's going to deal with the issues? That's that's a key problem. Also, the fact that getting done all these agreements, massive headache, huge headache, right? That you don't want to deal with that. You know, it makes sense. You know, we're bigger, more annoying than Switzerland. Um, we have, you know, a, a first past the post system, which can lead to two very radically different governments. Um, and that's a key issue. So why can't the UK get a bespoke uh, deal? Uh, because we are so powerful and cool. So I'm going to throw up the trade figures um, for the EU here. Given that we don't do physical checks and we're not going to uh, tariff EU goods, we're not going away um, from their total trade export. So the EU has us as a trade uh, as an export market, you know, that's not changing um, to the point where the UK, you know, are changing to a fully digital digital border system. I think that's mainly down to the fact that we can't handle the amount of imports we do from the EU or get by words, especially given that we have really bad issues with farming within the UK. Um, so why would they why would the EU give us a bespoke deal when that mainly benefits us? You know, it's our exports that are tanking massively um, when it comes to food. We're farming less. So that means we have to import more from somewhere. Where are we going to import from? Most likely the EU. So the EU can keep us on the hook as a market whilst the UK are losing the EU. So realistically, us joining the single market only really benefits us above the EU, should I say, if you compare the two. By value, the United Kingdom's exports to um, well, by value, the United Kingdom's exports to all 27 EU uh, members in 2021 represents 42.3% of our trade during 2021 that percentage compares to 47.3 one year earlier so you can see the trade already dropping due to the uh, brexit changes the import checks that the eu are doing on british goods as a result of brexit but the eu make up 42 percent of our uh, total exports right whereas we're around 13 percent of the eu's total exports so you can see right which one benefits more from a trade deal you know the, the country that's lost five percent of it, you know if it's total trade and it will keep going on you know as more and more checks come into place um, as we lose mutual recognition of uh, standards, etc., that you know total export number for us will keep dropping. We'll keep losing the EU as a trading partner um, purely because it's going to become too much of a hassle 
for us to export to the EU. So who benefits there from single market access? It's not the EU really, it's us, because there are other EU countries that are picking up the slack. You know, that percentage compares to, you know, 10% compared to, or sorry, 13% compared to 47.3%. Um, you know, the EU can make up the slack with the UK. They can start exporting more to third countries. Um, lots of developing countries want to deal with the EU and geography is more on their side than ours. You know, the EU is surrounded by third countries. We're not. We're surrounded by EU member states and EFTA countries. That's a big problem. We are a small island surrounded by the EU and EFTA countries. So we're not gonna we're gonna struggle to increase our imports and exports. The EU won't. So even if the EU do export slightly less to us, they can make up the difference with other countries. The UK um, exports with the EU will be lower than as as members due to the red tape, and EU member states are picking up some of the slack left behind by the UK. We've spoken about that before. I think it's Sweden and Portugal. They're actually trading more with the EU because they've lost. You know, the UK is gone as a trading partner. So the things that we used to export they're dead. So other countries are picking that up. That's something I've covered before. Those EU countries would be against giving us a bespoke deal potentially, as they are now taking the exports we effectively vacated. So for example, if you're Portugal and your trading figures are going up, you know, by, you know, say five, five to, between five and 10%, why would you want us let, why would you want us back in the EU or back in the single market when now you're making more money, you're doing more trade, your economy is doing better? Yes, you've lost the UK, um, as an export market, it's a lot. It's more difficult to export to the UK, but we're still there. We're still buying stuff, um, if you see what I'm saying. So they might be against um, any so-called bespoke deal. We're not big boss anymore. People need to understand this. We're not that guy. Yes, we're a big trading partner, but so are China and the US. Where are their bespoke deals? Sh um, should they not have more than just bilateral deals? Surely the US by now should have a free trade agreement, given how much the, um, the EU trades with the US. Surely China should have, you know, really great bespoke deals um, because of how much China trades with the EU, for example. Um, it doesn't make sense, does it? So why would the UK get special treatment? So for those people who make those arguments, I'm not going to name any names. I haven't done that, not in this video. Next time I will. But, you know, surely you've got to ask yourselves, why is it that the two top trading uh, countries in the world do not have bespoke deals with the EU? And why should why would the UK in that case? Also, the fact that the EU isn't just about trade, it's a peace product, a project. I'm talking about ideals. I'm talking ideals. We have to show that we can uphold these idea those ideals. Right now, no one trusts us, and they won't potentially for decades now. You know, broken trust. Broken trust can take years to heal, right? Decades even. And the UK had a bad reputation, you know, during the last few centuries. You know, suddenly now we're not going to have, it's going to take a long time to rebuild that reputation. We were an imperial power, an imperial superpower. Let's not forget that what we did to other countries. Why would the UK suddenly prove trustworthy now when we've put in two joke prime ministers in Theresa May and Boris Johnson, especially Boris Johnson? Why would, the, why would other people trust us? Um, so in conclusion, um, I have set out why the UK simply um, cannot simply rejoin the single market. Either you're a full member or the EU uh, of the EU, or you can join the single market via EFTA. Both of those are not going to happen. I've also mentioned why the Swiss model would not work, especially without EFTA membership. The UK would have to accept freedom of movement, and despite the airport queues for non-EU citizens being long, you know, in countries like Spain, that won't be enough to change people's minds. Trust is also key, uh, a key issue. The UK standing on the global stage and reputation to uphold agreements is in the bin. It's junk. So hopefully that all made sense because I failed to see the logic. I failed to see the logic here. As to why we would simply be allowed to rejoin. On this one, I've done a lot of research, uh, consulted an expert, so don't exert yourself in the comments. I'm not going to mention names this time. My channel wasn't built out to call other people to do um, that do the same things I do. But some days I'm just not sure. Uh, right now, it feels like I can't miss. Um, it just, you know, as as that as kind of tiring as doing videos are, you know, I am feeling a lot more energy than I did uh, a few weeks ago. Um, these project videos take a long time for me to do, but um, yeah, you know, if you have seen this video, stop misinforming people. Otherwise, I will mention names and use timestamps. No one wants that, right? No one wants me to start smoking people. I don't want to have to be that guy. It's important to understand all of this as people on Twitter and people in the same space as me on YouTube are constantly moaning about the Labour Party not talking about rejoining the single market. Well, there are reasons for that. Um, not all good reasons, but still. 
as the Arbiter would say, were it so easy. Were it so easy. You know, that's all from me. Let me know what you think of this uh, scripted stuff. Um, if you enjoyed more scripted content, I will try and do more of it in the future once I get, you know, the final form of my setup um, or closer to that. Support me on Patreon if you can or YouTube memberships um, and all the other YouTube stuff, like, comment, all of that stuff. Um, it wasn't a perfect video. I did miss out a couple of bits that I had to come back for. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that people enjoyed this video and you got something out of it. Um, shouts out to the Groundhog Day squad. Um, I know it's annoying having to constantly correct people who won't acknowledge you in the comments. It's very tiring. There's a reason why I engage with people in the comments because I can learn a lot from people who engage uh, with me on the channel. So um, it's one of the reasons why I managed to do this video and actually understand that one does not simply rejoin, one does not simply join the EU single market. That's the whole point of this video. I hope I've explained it well. I hope I've explained it well um, after. But um, anyways. Let me know what you think, uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, uh, share this video with anyone who talks nonsense, um, and if people keep doing this, I will mention names, um, but yeah, catch you next time, bye bye.